And so good afternoon. And today it's our pleasure to have um, Tom Newman with us. Tom um, is a cryospheric scientist who focuses on the development of ice scan, ice scan two. The next generation laser altimeter scheduled for launch in 2018. It's been launched, actually. <laughs> uh, so his research uh, includes both theoretical and experimental studies of the chemical, physical, and thermodynamic properties of polar, polar slow and ice. He's been involved um, extensively in field work on the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet leading four um, expeditions and participating in five other between the two poles. Um, recent work has involved studies of snow chemistry um, on the East Antarctic Plateau and calibrating um, the ice sand altimetry data using ground-based GPS survey. Um, so Tom joined um, NASA gathered in October um, 2008. P prior to then, he was an assistant professor in the geology department at University of Vermont. Um, he remains an affiliate assistant professor in Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington. Um, he received um, a BA in geophysical science from the University of Chicago and a PhD in geophysics from University of Washington. So let's welcome Tom. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cool. So yeah, I'm Tom. I'm going to tell you guys all about ISAT 2. Um, show of hands, how many people are familiar with ISAT 1? A handful of them. So apologies in advance. There's going to be some background you guys are super familiar with, so feel free to check out for a bit. Um, as the name of the mission, ISAT 2 suggests, there was a first mission called ISAT. Um, they didn't have the presence of mind or the optimism to call it ISAT-1, which would have been pretty awesome. Uh, so it's just ISAT. Um, ISAT was on orbit from 2003 to 2009, uh, collecting data over polar regions, as well as forests and oceans, using LIDAR. It was a single beam LIDAR, uh, took about 40 measurements per second. Uh, they had some issues with the laser uh, on the first ISAT mission that precluded them from running it full time. So they would kind of measure for about a month in spring, in northern hemisphere spring, and then another month in fall, and aggregate that data. Uh, and in, by operating it that way, they were able to get uh, six, seven years of observations in, those, in that campaign mode. Um, ISAT-2 uh, was born out of the last Earth Science Decadal Survey, so 2007. Uh, at that point, uh, they had about three years or so of ISAT data and said, wow, this data is phenomenal. We should really collect more of this kind of data. Uh, and ISAT-2 is the mission that, that grew out of it. As John mentioned, I came in 2008 to start working ISAT-2. Uh, and uh, we launched in September of 2018. So it was about 10 years from when I arrived to, to being on orbit, uh, which to me seemed like a very long time. To management, it seemed like quite a while as well. Um, but, uh, but I have the, uh, the pleasure of showing you guys some actual data of here's how it's, here's how it's doing. Uh, to get us all on the same page, there's just a couple of uh, background slides about what, what I mean when I say something like the polar regions or ice sheets or sea ice. So two slides about ice sheets. Um, they're formed by snow accumulation. They can be really thick. Uh, places in Antarctica are over four kilometers thick. Uh, they move really slowly. They deform under gravity, so they move uh, meters per year, sometimes hundreds of meters per year. Uh, and mass is lost from ice sheets either by melting at the surface, it then runs off in streams, or by calving of icebergs. So these are big pieces of ice that sit on land. As ice sheets grow, sea level falls, uh, and vice versa. When you lose mass from ice sheets, uh, sea level goes back up again. There are just two of them on the planet right now, one in Greenland, one in Antarctica. Sea ice, of course, is much different. Sea ice is formed by the freezing of ocean water. Uh, it primarily forms in the Arctic and Antarctic seas. Um, and it's much thinner, up to 20 meters thick or so at the most. Uh, it moves really quickly, kilometers per day, subject to wind drift and ocean drift. Uh, and it does melt and grow seasonally around both poles. Um, so yeah, two fundamentally different things. I started adding slides in like this at the beginning. Uh, and I was a, a little surprised that some yeah, so even some Earth scientists hadn't really appreciated the difference that they're kind of fundamentally different ways of 
different kinds of ice in our, in our environment. So, okay, so now we're all on the same page about sea ice and land ice. One of the things we learned about glaciers and ice sheets from the first ISAT mission was that Greenland was changing more than, than we thought it would. Uh, in this plot, the elevation change measured by ISAT is in the colors around the, around the coast. Um, red areas are gaining uh, volume and the purplish areas are losing. In some places, a lot. You see the scale kind of gets clipped there at 10 meters per year. That's such a giant signal, you know, you can't hardly miss it. Uh, that's, that's huge. Uh, the middle is a lot more subtle. That's uh, pretty close to zero, a little positive, a little negative here and there. But what we realized uh, with that first batch of ice that data is that most of the action on the ice sheets or the big action is around the edges. It's these outlet glaciers where the ice sheet interacts with the ocean in, in fjords and you get ocean circulation, changes in ocean temperature, causing big changes in these glaciers. Uh, so we knew when we were designing ISAT 2 that these were the parts of the ice sheet we had to do a really good job on, these outlet glacier uh, areas and edges. Down in Antarctica, uh, this one is, if it plays, yes it does, is a cumulative time series of mass loss from Antarctica from the GRACE mission. So that's a different mission, different way of measuring it, but essentially it measures changes in gravity. Uh, and GRACE uh, collected about 10 years of data and what you see in the color is the cumulative mass loss from Antarctica as measured by GRACE. Uh, GRACE gets you really good uh, time resolution, but pretty poor, relatively, spatial resolution. Uh, the, about as fine as uh, fine a data can get you is, is a couple hundred kilometers square. Uh, but what you see, of course, is West Antarctica, uh, this area that you've probably heard about in the news, these big glaciers that have been retreating. This area is losing a lot of mass. The Antarctic Peninsula losing a lot of mass. Uh, the larger East Antarctic ice sheet, is a, it's a lot more subtle. Uh, with, according to GRACE data, you can't really measure uh, a change. It's very close to zero in the middle. But of course, it's such a big area that even if it's plus or minus a centimeter per year, that adds up to be, to be quite a lot of mass change. Uh, so that's another one of the goals for ISAT 2 is to do a better job of, uh, of measuring the total balance of the Antarctic ice sheet. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Uh, by how much and where. Uh, for sea ice, this is a, a video of how, um, let's see if we can, of how the sea ice extent measured by passive microwave changes through time from, if you watch time march past here from the 1980s forward, uh, monthly images or monthly aggregates. And you can see how dynamic the sea ice is in the Arctic. It, it uh, grows and shrinks each year. Uh, the currents in the ocean uh, in general take the, uh, the first year ice that's formed over here. It's lost over on that, that coast of Greenland as it heads back south and melts. Um, so we've been able to measure the spatial extent of sea ice and monitor how that changes for quite a while. Imagery, passive microwave, I'll give you a picture of the extent of that sea ice. But what it doesn't tell you is the third dimension. How thick is it? Thicker sea ice is more resistant to break up from storms and from melting. Um, thinner sea ice is lost much more readily each year. Uh, just a regular storm can break up a lot of, a lot of thinner first-year sea ice. So with ISAT 2, one of our objectives is to measure uh, the freeboard of sea ice, and that is a means to get to the thickness. And I'll, I'll uh, walk through that with a graphic here in just a little bit. Uh, oops, let me try that again. Excellent. So here's the sea ice area in September of each year. It's the sea ice minimum. And so this is a, a press release that comes out every year in September about how are we doing sea ice minimum wise. And you can see from the 19, through the 1980s, it was relatively flat. You'd be hard pressed to say there's a trend there, but by the time you're into the 2000s and certainly the 2010s, you can see that we've lost a lot of, a lot of sea ice over that time. But again, we can measure readily the extent of it and how the extent changes, but not the thickness. Uh, similar picture for Antarctica. Uh, the Arctic trend is right here. The Antarctic trend is slightly positive, although it's, it's changed quite a lot in the last year or two. Um, yeah, again, can measure extent, but not, but not the thickness. So those kind of observations led to the objectives that you have up here. These are the, these are the science objectives for the mission. I'm not going to read through them in detail, but the first two are all about measuring ice sheet change and understanding the mechanisms for that change. The third one uh, is about measuring sea ice, estimating sea ice thickness. And then we have a fourth objective I haven't really talked about very much about uh, vegetation canopy. Uh, with the first ISAT mission, scientists realized you can estimate uh, tree height, canopy height globally. And of course, that, uh, 
that's something we can do with ISAT too, although the JEDI mission that some of you may work on uh, is designed to do that. So it's like their goal is to measure vegetation canopy height and that instrument and measurement strategy is designed for that. Uh, for us, it's kind of an, an add-on, if you will. Cool, so ISAT 2, measure height changes. We have a really high resolution spatially. With a LIDAR, you have a footprint on the ground, uh, and you can imagine, you can think of it as just like a beam going across the, the surface of the Earth. So you get a lot of great data along that beam, but you don't know much side to side with, with that. You, we have a low resolution temporally. Our orbit repeats every 91 days, so if you have a favorite glacier out there, uh, you'll get a look at it in October for example, and then 91 days later, you'll repeat that same track again, and you can see if it's growing or shrinking. So relatively low resolution temporally, but really good resolution spatially, especially along tracks. And I'll have some stats on that. How a LIDAR in space gets the elevation is, is shown schematically up here. Uh, we have a LIDAR uh, on ISAT-2. It's called ATLAS. It's the only instrument on ISAT-2. And what it does is sends out pulses of laser light and times really accurately how long the light takes to go from the spacecraft down to the ground and then back again, and that's the range measurement. If you know the speed of light, you can figure out that distance. The other two pieces you need are the pointing angle. Uh, it matters whether I've measured the range to that part of the wall or to that part of the wall, because you get much different answers, so you need to know your pointing angle. Uh, and then the third piece, of course, is GPS. Where am I in the orbit? Am I over Greenland or am I over Finland or some other place? So we use GPS data to figure out where we are in space. You combine those three things, the range measurement, the pointing angle, and GPS, and you can measure the elevation uh, of the surface of the Earth. Uh, of course, there's a, a lot more to it. There's a reason it took us 10 years to put it together. But in a one slide, that's, that's how it works. That's what you need to know. So unlike ISAT, the first ISAT mission, ISAT-2 is quite a bit different. Um, the first ISAT was a full waveform LIDAR, so it sent out a big pulse of light, and it, it uh, measured the returning light intensity as it came back uh, on a single beam about 40 times a second. ISAT-2 uses an approach uh, called photon counting. Uh, photon counting lets you send out really small pulses of laser light and detect individual photons as they come back, uh, hence the title measuring surface of the Earth one photon at a time. Uh, we have multiple beams. One of the things we realized from the first ISAT is the action is on the ice sheets are close to the edges, those steeply sloping outlet glaciers. So by uh, generating multiple beams, we can measure the slope of the ice in both the along track direction, and with pairs of beams, we can measure slope in the across track direction as well. One of the things photon counting lets you do is crank up the laser to send out many more pulses per second. Uh, ISAT sent out about 40 uh, shots a second. Uh, ISAT 2 is, oops, let me back up, is, uh, sends out 10,000 shots a second in each of its six beams. From our orbit, what that means is we get super dense along track sampling. Uh, between shot n and shot n plus 1, the observatory moves forward by about 70 centimeters. So we're oversampled in the along track direction, and you'll see what that looks like in the data. Uh, do, 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 that's all I'm going to say about that one. So yeah, if you could take a picture of what the beam pattern on the ground looked like, it would look like something in the upper right here. We have six beams. Uh, three of them are so-called strong beams, three of them are so-called weak beams. The energy difference between those is about four to one. Uh, and they're arranged in a rectangle pattern on the ground. By slightly yawing or clocking the spacecraft as it cruises forward along the direction of travel, it describes three pairs of beams on the ground. You have a strong beam and a weak beam paired together. Uh, within a pair, there's, the beams are spaced by about 90 meters, and that lets you measure that across track slope. And the pairs of beams are spaced by about three kilometers. So you have a central pair that's close to nadir, and then you have pairs to the left or right that are about three kilometers farther away. Our footprint size on the ground is uh, about 17 meters. It's actually less than that. It's closer to about 15. Um, but each shot is only separated by 70 centimeters along track. So again, shot N and N plus 1 overlap by quite a lot, because that spot is 15 meters in diameter and only moves forward by 70 centimeters each time. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is we use green laser light. Uh, lots of LIDARs use infrared, like uh, JEDI or ISAT-2, uh, in order to maximize the, the whole trade of uh, solar power and electrical power to optical power to, to photons back. Um, we ended up in the green part of the spectrum, 532 nanometers. Uh, so far, no one has 
seen the beam, at least not that I've heard about. I wish I wondered about if we were going to get a whole bunch of email about NASA making mysterious lights in the night sky. But so far it's been quiet, so that's, that's good. Uh, theoretically, you could see it if you had a camera looking up at exactly the right time at exactly that wavelength, uh, but no one has yet imaged the beam. Um, I'm not sure what I wanted to say about that one. So a couple of uh, details if, if you're into the technology side of things. I have one slide on specs for the transmitter. The next slide is specs on the receiver. Um, 532 nanometers, plus and decimal points. Footprint diameter we already talked about. Um, the strong beam and the weak beam energy is right here. The ratio of the energies between them is, is about 4 to 1. I'm happy to go and walk through any of these in more detail if folks are interested. A similar one slider on the receiver. Our telescope is 80 centimeters. Um, we had two telescopes, and the spare uh, was used by JEDI, so that's up in space now as well, which is cool. Uh, the receiver field of view on the ground is just about 40 meters, so we have a 17-meter spot we're trying to capture in a 40-meter uh, field of view of the telescope. Uh, and there's an individual field of view for each one of the six beams. Uh, photons per shot, we send out trillions of photons, of course, with each one of these really small laser pulses. Uh, and for best conditions, super reflective surface, like the middle of the Antarctic ice sheet, clear atmosphere, so there's very little scattering or absorption, we get about 10 photons back for the strong beam. So that's a really bad return on investment photon-wise, uh, but photons are cheap, as it turns out. And, uh, and this is a, a sort of sweet spot for us for strong beam and for weak beam in terms of the number of photons coming in um, and, uh, yeah, and how accurately we can, can measure each of them. Okay, so orbit coverage. We go from, uh, our orbit takes us from 88 degrees north to 88 degrees south. It's not a sun-synchronous orbit. Uh, most of the ice, of course, is in the polar area, so we wanted to sample as much of that as possible. But of course, from uh, the vantage point of space, uh, ISAT-2 is collecting data all the way around the orbit. So we're getting data over oceans, uh, over vegetated areas, as, as I'd mentioned, um, as well as clouds. With, uh, uh, by using optical wavelengths like green, uh, if it's a cloudy day here in Maryland when ISAT-2 passes overhead, what we'll end up measuring is the elevation at the top of the cloud. We might get some return from within the cloud. We have data products specific to cloud layers and cloud height and that sort of thing. When we were doing our simulations, uh, we estimated about 50% loss uh, just due to clouds. Um, I think that's all I was going to say about that. Uh, I'm, I'll maybe reiterate it that although we're designed to measure changes in sea ice, and in ice sheets, and we have specific data products for that. We also have products for uh, land elevation and canopy height, for ocean elevation, uh, clouds, uh, and inland water. Uh, one of our hydrologists on the team has a data product specific to inland water body elevation, which is cool. Okay, so this is a little video about, about launch day. Um, I'll just sort of let that play. It was put together by uh, by our, uh, our industry partners. So our instrument, ATLAS, was built, designed and built at Goddard, right up the road. The spacecraft bus uh, was developed by what used to be Orbital and then Orbital ATK, and now it's north of Grumman, in Gilbert, Arizona, same group that did Landsat 8 and a handful of other NASA Earth Science missions. Um, we launched on a Delta II rocket uh, by ULA. Uh, the Delta II had been around for a very long time. This was the 100, oh, I'm going to get the number wrong. I think it was the 158th launch of the Delta II, and it was actually the last one. Um, Delta IIs had launched lots of prior missions, including the first ISAT. Uh, we launched in September, uh, September 15th, 2018, which incidentally was also my birthday. So thank you all for chipping in to <laughs> buying me a rocket launch on my birthday. Let's do it again next year. Uh, it was early morning. It was a 6 a.m. launch. Uh, and it had been super cloudy the previous days, so we weren't at all sure that we'd actually see anything. But on this particular day, we all had a, a pretty good view of it, as you'll see. There's inspirational music that goes along with it if you watch it on YouTube. But yeah, there you go. You know, it was, it was sort of funny. I had talked to other folks who had worked on Landsat 8 or JTSS about, oh, what, so what does it feel like when you've worked on one of these things for 10 years and then you see it sitting on top of a rocket and there's all sorts of noise and fire? And they're like, it's kind of terrifying, but it'll be okay. Um, yeah, and it absolutely was.
yeah, it went into a cloud deck pretty early on, and then it came out the other side. We had cameras on. So what you, uh, cameras on the, uh, I guess it was on the second stage, watching the observatory as it released from the rocket, which was cool. That was over Africa, and we had uh, near real-time telemetry of that separation, which was picture perfect. Totally cool. All right, so data. What does this data look like? We launched September 15th. Uh, we turned Atlas on over the period of the next couple of weeks in the spacecraft and turned the laser on on October 1st. Uh, on October 3rd, we had our first look at what the, what the data looks like. And I have a whole bunch of plots like this, so I'm going to walk you through what, what this is showing here. Uh, each one of these dots is a photon detected by Atlas and for which the, the data, the arrival time and the transmit time of the laser pulse is all telemeter to the ground. And in ground processing, we turn each of those arrivals, along with the pointing angle and the GPS, into a latitude, a longitude, and an elevation of that photon. And so in, in these plots, you have elevation along the y-axis and either time or distance along track along the x-axis. So the sun puts out uh, green photons as well, and some of them are at exactly our wavelength, so Atlas detects those. And that's this speckle you see of both ab above and below, top and bottom of the plot. The photons reflected off the surface form this thick blue line across the, middle, uh, across the middle of the plot. Your eye can't miss it. That's composed of thousands and thousands of photons. Uh, the distance shown here is, is many kilometers, 10 kilometers. So there are uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of photons in that blue line. You get fooled a little bit when you look at a plot like this because it looks like, wow, there's so much noise and above and below, and that's terrible. Uh, but when you uh, actually get in and do and do some math on this, it's like you can't miss this return. Um, yeah, so anyway, so bunches of plots like this. This was our first plot over the middle of Antarctica, and super exciting, of course, for all of us who had worked on it to say, yay, you know, it actually, it actually works. <laughs> you can detect photons from space and turn it into an elevation plot. So let's have a look at, at uh, some early data products. Here's a slice over an outlet glacier in West Antarctica. And what you see again are these photons, uh, some background photons. The surface jumps right out at you. And the black line here is a reference surface from a, a DEM made with other data. Uh, and so we've just plotted it up here for reference. But what you see is that Atlas, the nice tattoo, 2 is doing an excellent job of tracking the surface. Even over these really steep walls, this is a big crack uh, in an outlet glacier where an iceberg is about to form. And that was really cool. Uh, the distance along track, if I can read the scale here, uh, this from here to here is about 400 meters. So this crack is about 100 meters wide. So that's a pretty steep slope through here. This is 50 meters above sea level, and this is basically sea level. So that thing isn't vertical, but it's pretty close to vertical. And we're collecting data all the way down one side and part of the way back up the other. So this was, this was just fantastic uh, for us to see that we were able to, to image that uh, not to image, but to measure the elevation on each of these bumps and wiggles in the surface. Uh, what that lets you do is stuff like is shown here. It's a plot by Catherine Walker at Goddard. Um, ISAT collected data along this rift in October 2008. Just about 10 years later, ISAT 2 came by and measured the same rift. The ISAT data is shown here in the pink. ISAT 2 comes along 10 years later. Again, you see the background. But the surface return just jumps right out at you. So by combining these two data sets, you can do stuff like measure not only how the surface elevation has changed, uh, but also how these cracks have grown through time. And you can see how much more data you get from ISAT 2 uh, in that with the first ISAT, we have what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, maybe 10 shots that make up uh, the elevation profile across that. And with ISAT 2, it's nearly continuous, even though those are really steep slopes. So that's totally cool. That's, uh, that'll be really neat to, to see what scientists do with all of that data. Uh, another thing that we're able to do is, is measure melt ponds. So most of the mass loss in Antarctica is from iceberg calving. Uh, but we, there is some melt water along the edges. And so one of the things we noticed in the data early on was that, OK, here's these plots of elevation along track. You get a flat a return off the surface of the pond, surface of a melt pond, which is pretty flat. But some of the light is getting down through the melt pond and reflecting off of the water ice interface. So we're actually doing bathymetry on meltwater ponds. Here's a much more complicated picture uh, right down here where this pond is many kilometers long, and you see all of the topography there. Uh, this would be one way you could get at uh, meltwater volume production, because we'll actually have data on it, which is totally cool. 
And of course, our big objective is to measure the elevation and elevation changes of the ice sheet. Here's an aggregation of the first three weeks of data over Antarctica. Um, you, the shape of it kind of looks like what you would think, which is good. Um, East Antarctica is much higher than West Antarctica. But by comparing this data with data from ISAT collected 10 years ago, we'll get a picture of how uh, the ice sheet has been changing through time. And then as we accumulate more and more data from ISAT 2, we'll get much finer time resolution. Again, we'll revisit each one of those tracks every 91 days. So four times a year, uh, you'll get data along uh, each of 1,387 ground tracks. Uh, with the caveat that if it was cloudy that day, you're going to have to wait another 91 days to get a particular glacier. Uh, but by aggregating all of this data, we get a, a great uh, map of how the elevation in Antarctica or Greenland is changing with time. Um, for sea ice, it's a, the objectives are a little bit different. Uh, we're not just measuring elevation of the sea ice, but we're interested in freeboard uh, as a means to get at the thickness. So I'm going to pause on this one if I can. So cool. So sea ice is floating in ocean water. Great. Some fraction of the sea ice sticks up out of the ocean uh, just due to the density differences between ice and water, just like an ice cube in a, in a glass of water. And the height of the sea ice sticking up out of the ocean is called the freeboard. So in this picture, uh, <laughs> bear with me and let me know how I do on the freeboard uh, and sea ice thickness discussion. But uh, So in, in this picture, we're measuring the elevation of the ocean in one of these cracks in the sea ice called leads. And we want to compare it with the measurement of the height of the sea ice sticking up out of the ocean. The difference in those two heights is the freeboard. And by knowing the density differences and making some assumptions about snow loading and that sort of thing, you can come up with an estimate of what the uh, total thickness of that sea ice is. There's a lot more that gets bundled into it, right? But, uh, but in a nutshell, that's how, that's how you do it. So for ISAT2 data, we want to measure all of these elevations along the green line, but then compare ocean elevations with sea ice elevations. So we need to separate those into those two buckets and then compare them. If I let the animation play a little more, uh, you'll remember how dynamic sea ice is, that it, uh, it moves with winds and with current. Uh, so you never know ahead of time where these leads in the sea ice are going to be. So your algorithm needs to chew through all that photon data, decide if you're looking at a lead or at sea ice, and then separate those elevations appropriately. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Cool. So yeah, this adds that third dimension to sea ice that we weren't able to get at before. You could see what the extent was, but now with this kind of data, uh, you can get at the get at thickness estimates through the freeboard. And there you go, and it's cruising around the world. Yay. Oops, try again. So what does that data actually look like? In this plot, uh, the, you see the red bar for reference. That's 70 kilometers on a, a long track distance, and the height over here now is in meters, because this is sea ice floating on, floating on the ocean. Uh, and one thing your eye might pick up right away is these flat areas. Those are really big sea ice leads, right? The scale here is 70 kilometers, so these things are 10 kilometers across. But it's nice for an il illustration standpoint. Sea ice is really bumpy and, and has ridges and drifts and dunes and all sorts of things. And you can see how, how varied the elevation is over the rougher sea ice. But you start looking at this a little bit, and you say, all right, there's two big leads here, but there's a whole bunch of smaller leads in there as well. With our footprint diameter of 17 meters, uh, we can get elevation measurements in sea ice leads as small as about 10 meters across. We're getting photons from the surface. You combine those photon elevations together uh, to come up with an estimate for the, for the ocean height in each of these leads, and then compare it with the average height of sea ice aggregated over some distance. So by aggregating data for the first two weeks of the mission, uh, when we were in science data collection, started October 14th, uh, Ron Kwok has a data product that calculates sea ice freeboard. It separates those elevations into either sea ice or, or uh, open ocean, compares them. And so here's a map of the sea ice freeboard in October in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, at that time of year, we're just past the sea ice minimum. So this is a lot of first year sea ice that's pretty thin. Our measurement requirement uh, for ISAT 2 is to measure sea ice freeboard as small as three centimeters, so about yay much, uh, and it's and we're uh, we're meeting that so far. Uh, Ron's best estimate is that we can measure sea ice freeboard down to about two centimeters, uh, in best case, which is which is fantastic. Certainly, Arctic is a cloudy area. We lose a lot more than half of the data 
at certain times of year, just, just due to loss through clouds or fog or that sort of thing. Uh, but when it's clear skies, we get uh, really, really good data on, on sea ice thickness uh, or sea ice freeboard. Uh, this was the first image of ISAT 2 from the ground. So this isn't imaging the laser. I don't know if people, I can't, I can barely see it here. Can folks see this thin line through here in the, uh, in the blow up here? Uh, Jeremy Harbeck was down on Operation Ice Bridge in Punta Arenas, Chile in October. Took out his camera in the middle of the night, took a 20 second exposure and caught uh, ISAT 2 passing overhead as the sun hit its, uh, hit its uh, solar arrays and caused a reflection, which is cool. First sighting of ISAT 2. So some other cool data. So we covered the uh, ice sheets and the sea ice, great. Um, but of course we collect data globally. So here's some data off the coast of Canada. Um, 4.2 kilometers along track in that direction. Here's elevation, these ticks are about two meters apart. And it's like, hey, great, we're getting photons off the ocean surface. When you zoom in on it a little bit, it turns out we're able to actually resolve wave structure under good conditions. So this is about 700 meters along track, and these wave amplitudes are oh, about four or five meters. So that'd be a nice, gentle ocean swell in, in the Arctic if you were out in the Arctic or in the uh, Atlantic, the North Atlantic in October. Uh, so yeah, this is data from the strong beams, which is really cool. Uh, vegetation. Here's some vegetation data. Uh, this is. This is a dark picture, but uh, it's a, a snap from Landsat 8 with our two lines of data uh, going across the scene. So what you see here is that it was a sunlit day, a sunlit path, so there's a lot of background. Um, but you see a bright line at the bottom, that's the ground return. And this uh, blurrier return are returns off of the canopy, off of trees, branches, whatever. Uh, and the goal of that algorithm is to measure uh, tree height by comparing the top of the canopy with the ground return underneath it. By zooming in a little more uh, in this lower panel, uh, this is now, oh, these are in seconds, so that's about a second, so that's kind of seven kilometers or so in this direction. Uh, tree heights are about 20 meters through here. You can see what's a cut in the trees for either a road or power lines. Uh, and this was a path in, uh, in Russia, also from October. But that's really cool. We didn't have a measurement requirement for canopy height because it's not our primary science we're after. Uh, but this should be useful for people studying vegetation canopy height from space. By combining this data with JEDI, uh, JEDI data, which is optimized to measure canopy height, we should get a really good data set of canopy heights globally. All right, so another one of these plots uh, going down a forested hillside in Mexico. Cool, you can see the trees through here. Uh, out onto the lagoon where we're getting a nice bright return off the top of the water, but we're also getting a return through the ocean water in the lagoon. And you're, we're seeing some shallow water bathymetry through here across a reef and then down down to the ocean where we see some of those familiar ocean waves that we've seen before, which is really cool. Uh, the lower panel is another, uh, another path near there, uh, but in this one the unique part is this mangrove forest over here. Uh, when we have super still flat water and we're sending that pulse of laser light down and coming back, it acts like a mirror. It's a specular return. And so we're not only able to measure the heights of these trees, but also we know that the water is still and flat due to this multiple return we see down here. That's an effect of the atlas detectors being saturated by so much light coming back to it. So it would be a way to map the extent of mangrove forest uh, wherever we have data. Um, so their spatial extent as well as their height which is cool. Yeah, and here's another one off the coast of Australia. Uh, coming down from left to right off the land, trees at the coast. And in this case, we're getting a whole lot of amazing bathymetry. Uh, this is about nine meters of water. It looks like we're getting some returns down here to about uh, 26 meters, which is great. Um, some of the folks on the science team are super excited about it, working on developing a bathymetry data product. Uh, Nearshore bathymetry is one of the hard things to measure. You can't get ships in there very easily, um, but by using ISAT2 data, it looks like we should be able to measure bathymetry through about 10 meters of water. Um, we figured pre-launch that we would be able to measure uh, through some water. I was guessing a couple of meters or so in pretty still conditions. I never would have guessed it would have been order of 10 meters. Uh, but it is cool, because here's the ocean surface. It's flat in the shallow water, which is what you'd expect. As you get to deeper water, you see some of that wave structure sh start to show up as well. 
Uh, and this is some of the deepest water we've seen. It's across Bikini Atoll, which of course is super clear water, because I think we killed everything there in about 1964. But anyway, very clear water. You can image through almost 100 feet or 30 meters of water, which is phenomenal. OK, so our goal in the polar regions, you point at the same track every 91 days when you come by. In the mid-latitudes, we have a different strategy. Their goal is to measure canopy height globally, so we don't want to point at the same track over and over again. We're not trying to measure how fast the trees grow. Uh, so every 91 days when we come past a particular track, we're doing a series of off-pointing to make as dense a grid as we can. So if these dark blue lines are where we would collect data along our reference tracks every 91 days, uh, 91 days later, instead of pointing here, we'll split the difference. We'll point off to the side and fill in the gap between these two tracks. Uh, 91 days later, maybe we point off the other direction to fill in the, uh, the blue line over here, and so on, so that after two years of data collection, or about eight cycles, uh, our tracks facing at the equator will be uh, just under two kilometers. Of course, caveat, clouds. Some place like Brazil is going to have lots of fog. We'll only occasionally get good looks at it. Um, but by continuing this through time, uh, we expect to be able to build up that map of, uh, of canopy height globally. Uh, this is another cool thing you get with, uh, with ISAT-2, is that uh, with our altitude and our inclination and our 16 pattern, uh, where track A crosses track B, maybe an ascending against a descending, it's not just one beam crossing one beam, it's six beams crossing six beams. So if you make a map of what that looks like, you end up with 36 individual crossovers. And you get these all over the planet uh, every day. We have 15 orbits per day. Uh, and it's a, a really useful tool to monitor how stable is Atlas's measurement, how stable is our data product. Uh, if the crossover of track A and track B is, is some number of hours apart, you don't expect the surface of the Earth to change measurably. Uh, so by comparing those, you can see how stable are we through time. So this is a super useful tool for us to monitor how Atlas is doing. Um, so now I'll transition into our data product suite. What we've been looking at so far is what we call ATLO3. That's our geolocated photon cloud. You get a latitude, you get a longitude, you get a height for every photon, among other parameters. Higher level products then aggregate those photons. Say, for example, the sea ice product, you're taking uh, all those photons, deciding which are from the ocean, which are from sea ice, putting them into separate buckets so that you can get to a sea ice freeboard product. Similarly, for land ice, he's aggregating data over about 40 meters and turning it into a single elevation measurement posted at 40 meters along track. So we have a whole host of, of uh, level, uh, I guess, well, depending how you slice it, I'll call it a higher level data product uh, for these different surface types. The lower level products are all developed and implemented by people at Goddard. I, for example, uh, am the lead of the ATL03, Geolocated Photon Cloud product. Uh, and then for the higher level products, uh, folks on the science team are leading those who are discipline uh, specific. Ben Smith at University of Washington is leading the Ice Sheet product, for example, or Jamie Morrison is leading the Ocean product. Uh, data volumes are big with ISAT2, 10,000 shots a second, six beams at a time somewhere between 1 and 10 photons per shot, about 100 parameters for each one of those photons. It gets big. Um, atl 3 data is about 500 gigabytes a day, give or take. So it's not the kind of data set you're just going to download a day's worth of data and just plot it. You need to be a, a little more savvy than that. Even if you were only taking a tenth of the data, let's say you only wanted the, the ice sheet data, uh, that's still going to be 50 gigabytes a day. You're very quickly going to go broke buying hard drives. Um, so our, our uh, higher level products are much smaller. I'll pick on the, sea ice pro uh, the land ice products more. That's ATL06. That's on the order of four gigabytes a day. And that starts to become a little more manageable. If you're just interested in the Antarctic or part of the Antarctic, it's smaller yet. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're big products, especially when you're getting into data at, at the photon rate. For data availability, we're getting super close to releasing data. Uh, I thought we were. We would have been there in, in February, but then this thing called the shutdown happened. I don't know if you guys heard about that, um, but that didn't make anything any easier for, for us, at least. Um, our requirement is to release in May of this year, and we're going to make that. Uh, the ATL03 data should be, will be out by the end of May, and most of the higher level data products will also come out in May. 
after that first release, our, our requirement is to get our data out 45 days after the data collection. That's driven by two things. Um, one is all the ancillary data you need to do that geolocation, so the precise GPS ephemeris uh, and a no number of other model inputs, um, and have some time for evaluation to make sure it's working the way it's supposed to. Most of those higher level products have a requirement of also 45 days after the data collection. Our data center is National Snow and Ice Data Center. If you go there today, um, you won't see data, but you'll see a lot of documentation about the data. So you can read about what's in the sea ice product or how, how does the ocean product work, uh, what length scale is that over, and that sort of thing. Um, so stay tuned in the next couple of weeks. I was hoping when John and I agreed to do this that you know, first week of, uh, last week of April, first week of May, the data would be out and we could go through data examples and we could plot some stuff up. That was not the case. But it will be soon. Uh, cool, how am I doing on time? I've got a few minutes, so okay, I'll, I'll go through this part. Um, ISAT 2 goes up to 88 north and 88 south. It turns out all of our tracks are tangent to that 88 degree line of latitude. In the Arctic, that's in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, kind of hard to get to. Uh, but in the Antarctic, if you know the right people, you can actually go to 88 degrees south. And it's a great place to do calibration studies for ISAT 2 because you your tangent to that circle 15 times a day. Uh, so two years ago, I went with, uh, with Essex superstar Kelly Brunt. I don't know if she's here. I don't see her, but tell her I said nice things about her if you see her. She's actually down the hall from me at Goddard. Um, but uh, we went down to the South Pole. We loaded up uh, some tractors with high precision GPS equipment, and we drove out to the 88 degree south line of latitude. Actually, 87.979 was the sweet spot. Uh, and drove 300 kilometers along this arc and measured the surface elevation with GPS. Uh, Kelly and Adam Greeley repeated it last year, so now we have two surveys of this surface, and that traverse will repeat each year. It intersects 277 of our ground tracks, so about 20% of those, of those ISAT-2 tracks. With our ground-based GPS, we can measure the uh, surface uh, to better than a centimeter with about eight centimeters of, of precision. So it's an awesome data set for calibrating ISAT-2. So as we get new data in, we're routinely comparing the ATL-03 data, the ATL-06 data, against our ground-based measurement right here, because we see it every day. Uh, that, that stretch right through here has also been flown by Operation IceBridge. IceBridge is an aircraft campaign that was designed to fill the gap, bridge the gap, between ISAT and ISAT-2. Uh, and they have flown this arc uh, on three different occasions over the last, oh, five years or so. So that uh, gives us a lot of, um, a lot of statistical power to, to know how that surface is changing and what, what its characteristics are. Here's what it looks like down in 88 South on a nice sunny day. Uh, we had two tractors right up here. Uh, we brought our tents along with us, mounted on one big long sled. Uh, each tractor had one sled back there. Everything you'd need for about three weeks out on the road, uh, generator for power, and then of course these tents to, to sleep in. It was a, a nice little road trip. Except without a road, I guess, but uh, I digress. Uh, anyway, the other thing we put out there was uh, corner cube retroreflectors. With our wavelength, 532 nanometers, you can buy uh, little pieces of optical glass that's about that big um, that reflects all of the incident light upon them. So we mounted these things in plastic caps, left them on bamboo poles out along 88 South. And as ISAT-2 passes overhead, the laser light from Atlas is reflected from these and goes back up to, uh, to the spacecraft. We survey the location of these things each year. So we know not only their height very well, but also their latitude and longitude. So while comparing the elevation along our track gives us a, a check on the Atlas elevation, by comparing the location of these in our data, and comparing it with where we know they are in latitude, longitude space, it also checks our geolocation. Are we putting these returns where they're supposed to be? So that's another, another really useful calibration tool. Uh, here's what some of the data looks like. Um, this is 300 kilometers along track in this plot. This giant hill here is all of about 100 meters high, so it's a 100 to 1 vertical exaggeration, or 1,000 to 1 vertical exaggeration through here. You barely knew you were, you couldn't tell you were going uphill or downhill. You could tell it was a little bit lumpy, but it looks like a giant hill, but it's really, really subtle. Uh, and here's what some of the uh, data look like from our two GPS comparing with the airborne ATM data uh, from IceBridge. So yeah, super useful data set for calibration. 
Um, this is my last slide, and uh, it's got the link here for NSIDC for our data products. So far, the Atlas laser has been on since October 1st. I did the math this morning when I updated this. We're at 181 billion shots on that laser. Uh, it's designed to last three years, uh, but so far, knock on wood, the entire instrument has been really stable, really healthy, and we're really, at least I'm really looking forward to getting data out there. Uh, I get lots of email from folks saying, hey, when, when's it coming out and can I, get in a, can I just get a little taste of what this looks like for my area, this area? Like, just wait, it'll be there soon, uh, just a few weeks away. Uh, the uh, first version of the data won't be our last or best version. No doubt we'll reprocess, we'll get better, but this first version of the data uh, the geolocation on the photons is good to about 10 meters horizontally. Some places a little more, some places a little less. And the vertical precision is good to about 10 centimeters. So it's going to be a super useful data set for science. That's about what ISAT got to by the end of its lifetime. And that's, that's where we're starting from. And we'll, we'll just get better through time. Anyway, thanks for bearing with me. That is what I have. Thanks for coming. Chris Higgins. Yeah, it's a very nice talk. So my question is, uh, you, you show the case almost is a clear sky. We know the laser, you know, is attenuated by the clouds. Yep. I just wondering how how often the signal cannot reach the ground. Yeah. yeah. Your data size. So when we're doing simulations, we estimated about 50% uh, of the time we would lose the data entirely. As it turns out, uh, we can see through an optical depth of atmosphere of about 1.5 and still see the surface. Um, one of the open questions with our data will be, how good is our data when we're ranging through clouds? Because you get multiple scattering, you get attenuation. So far, I don't have a good number for you, but I have no doubt that people in the science community uh, are going to take just the cloudy data, compare it with just the clear sky data, and see how much bias we're getting or how much uh, signal loss we're getting. But yeah, that's, that's work TBD. Another question uh, is not a question, the general uh, comments, yeah. Can you comment about that? You know, the NASA has uh, several, you know, the LiDAR mission. Yep. Calypso, also the ISAT-1, ISAT-2. Yep. Also, ESA have a uh, wind LiDAR. So for, from your point of view, you know, is, uh, what's the disadvantage and the challenge for the LiDAR mission? Yeah, you just show, you know, is, uh, the advantages. I yeah, just wonder, heard you have any, you know, the challenges, you know, for this kind of active, you know, sensors yeah, yeah. put on the space. So our, our two big challenges that, that uh, took a long time uh, maybe three of them. Um, one is the alignment. Our spot size is 17 meters on the ground. Our field of view is 45 meters. And you have to keep all six beams aligned at the same time. Uh, for, uh, for comparison, um, oh, which one should we use? Let's use uh, uh, LRO at the moon. They had five spots. And they ended up with, a, with some thermal distortion that caused one of their spots to drift in and out of the field of view. Uh, so making a system uh, like Atlas that allows you to keep all the spots aligned all the way around in orbit through all kinds of thermal distortion as the thing shrinks and whatever, um, that was a challenge. We actually have active beam steering on here to keep, keep those things aligned. We're updating the position of the beams about 10 times a second. Uh, but it's really tight tolerance on the alignment. Uh, the second one is timing. We're timing each individual photon uh, to about uh, in in height space, about 23 centimeters for each photon. Uh, and that's random. So as you combine lots of photons together, you can beat down that uncertainty. But keeping the clock super stable and the times aligned across each of the spots so you can compare data from spot one with spot two uh, in some sensible way, that was also a challenge. Uh, and then the third one was lasers. Uh, ISAT-1 did have lots of problems with its laser that limited its, its lifetime. So ISAT-2, we spent lots of time on design and review of these lasers. Um, the company that built them is FiberTech out in Virginia. They were the same company that built the lasers on Calypso. Uh, those lasers, anybody, do you know when Calypso launched? Is it eight years ago now? Something like that, nine years? Uh, those lasers are still clicking along for Calypso. So FiberTech knows how to do this. Um, knock on wood, we'll get eight or nine years out of each of these lasers. We have one primary one on board and then one redundant that we can switch to if the first laser has a problem. Uh, but yeah, that was another place we spent a lot of time for sure. And you're right, Goddard has done several of these. The uh, atmospheric LIDARs like Calypso, they don't have the 
same measurement precision we do. Their data is binned into what 30 meter bins, and we're trying to do, you know, better than 30 centimeters. So it's uh, you know two orders of magnitude finer timing, and then the multiple beam thing is tough as well. Yeah. Okay. So. When uh, do we expect you to deliver the ocean product? Yeah, the ocean product is going to be great. Uh, the, uh, that should come out just about the same time as ATL03. So it should be in May or early June. Um, we didn't know ahead of time how good the surface reconstruction was going to be. So for ocean in particular, I'm, I'm confident that, that the product that comes out won't be the last best final product. People will figure out how to fit harmonics to the data and that sort of thing. What he's doing now, uh, Jamie Morrison, is computing ocean elevation uh, in, ooh, I forget how many shots he's aggregating, sort of order 10 kilometers or so. So it's a pretty, where I sat too, pretty coarse data product. Over the ocean, it's not super reflective in green, in the green part of the spectrum. So you get about one photon per shot. So he's aggregating many thousands of shots together to get good signal to noise on the ocean surface. Um, but that's ATL 12, and that'll be out through NSIDC in May or early June. Thank you, Tom. I think a very nice presentation. <clears throat> I'm very well educated. Yeah. So the one question that about the inland water yeah. uh, data products. Yep. Sounds very exciting. Uh, will that be for lakes, you know, reservoirs, yep. or it can detect the uh, you know stage or elevation change of uh, you know uh, of, along the rivers or something like that? Yeah. You have some comp yeah. Yeah, so we cross rivers at whatever angle we cross them at. They're usually oblique. Occasionally, we get a track that goes right down a river just, you know, by luck. Um, ATL 13 is the inland water data product. The first version of it uh, will have, I, I think he's limiting it to uh, water bodies of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers and larger. Um, but ultimately, his uh, database has uh, 1.6 million water bodies that are at least one kilometer by one kilometer. So these small ones are a little harder. It's going to be a, uh, it'll be interesting to see how the user community deals with that data set once it's at its, its full size because there's so many little lakes. I mean, I was pulling my hair out. I'm like, Mike, what are you doing? You know, yeah. these are tiny. Yeah, yeah. You that's... can't do that. Just the great, give me the great lakes, give me the big ones, Lake Baikal. But he's like, no, 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 no. Those are easy. We got to do these hard ones. So yeah, there are yeah, 1.6 million different lakes. Um, one of the things the uh, flood community was interested in is river stage. So he has masks for rivers in there as well. Um, of course, with our data latency, it'll be more useful retrospectively because it'll come out you know a month after the flood happened, and that's not so useful for uh, for a flood warning. Um, but for flood modeling, it's going to be super useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, the other thing I should say is if you go to our project website, uh, isat2.gsft.nasa.gov, or just search for isat2, you can find our ground tracks. You can download those and plot them in your area of interest. If you study, you know, a river somewhere, you can see where, where the tracks cross it. It's over there on your website, you probably there. Yeah, it'll link to it from there or just from our project website. Is it available now? Or yeah. Is it okay. It's available right now. Yep, KMZ Great. files. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so with Dan, let's ramp up and thanks, speaker, again. Thanks again.